on cornerofthegalaxy.com. It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, the show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Coming in to, to you on Monday, January 25th. Uh, a busy weekend, I guess, or at least a busy Monday for the LA Galaxy. A lot of stuff to get to, a lot of stuff to talk about around Major League Soccer. Uh, certainly going to talk about some players, some rumors, a whole bunch of things sort of lined up, including some things that we once again got wrong through no fault of our own. So a lot of stuff to talk about, and I'm sure we're going to get to a whole bunch of it to help me do it. The Panda is back himself, Mr. Kevin Baxter. How's it going, Kev? Hey, I can see you. I know. you Again, what do you know? You know... We were talking earlier today, and you told me that this show is uh, right around number 300 in China, correct? Yeah, ranking ranking rise number 302 or something like that in sports. In you know, was, Ch- Yeah, go ahead. You know why that is? I was thinking. It's the panda angle. <laughs> that's, that's what it is? And people tune in, and then they realize they're, they, we don't really talk about pandas, and, and then they move on, and there's like 1.4 billion people in China, so... By the time you cycle through all those people, we're still getting big audiences. So I think we should embrace it. Ni hao, everybody. Welcome <laughs> I, to I was the Galaxy. Yeah, welcome. We'll just do it in in, in Chinese. Um, yeah, it, that's a you know that's a that's a dubious sort of rank. We don't even you know we don't hit the charts in the United States outside of like you know the top fifteen or sixteen hundred. I think something like that in sports. Um, it may even be more than that. Maybe like three thousand. I don't know. I I checked but the we're charts. Killing like, it in China. But we're huge. We're huge in China. And you know what I've been thinking, uh, you know, with 1.4 billion people, if you're one in a million in China, there's a thousand people just like you. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> true enough. Absolutely true. Good stuff. All right. Um, ni hao. Ni hao. Say ni hao. Come on. I'm, I, I will not. I will absolutely yeah. not. Um, let's see. Uh, let's get to a, a little bit of LA Galaxy stuff. Wait. Hold on. I almost forgot. There's some more There's some more important thing we need to talk about, and that's uh, that's you, you're working with a broken paw. Uh, from, I, from I am. I, yes. You want to tell everybody how you broke your foot? I am on the d- disabled list. I will. Uh, I, I hope to be in training camp by the twenty second. Yes. The guys. But um, you know, I didn't even uh, when I saw the 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 guy stealing the money from those orphans, stealing no. their lunch money. No. <laughs> and then I chased them in their no. Camaro. No. <laughs> nope, that wasn't it. <laughs> okay. Well, I was running. I was running. Yes. Was early in the morning, I gave this woman a big. A lot of room. I went around her on the sidewalk to give her her COVID space. And then as I tried to come up the high curb on the other side, I tripped and fell and broke my foot. Didn't know it was broken. Uh, had to get go back home two and a half miles, run back home, running on the broken foot for two and a half miles. I think that might have done it in. Yeah, I was going to say that's a that's a tough break, as they say. Um, so, yeah. And the sun was in your eyes. I mean, how can you how, you should have put on some eye black. That's what it should have been. You know, like the baseball players do out in the outfield. The, I, the, sun, guess the, the sun was in my eyes. It was early morning, but you're not buying the orphans and the milk money. And no, I think yeah. you should. I think you should come up with a better story. So, by the way, yeah. somebody complained last time that we took too long to start talking about the L.A. Galaxy. So I'm inclined to talk for the next 20 minutes about everything but the LA but, Galaxy. Okay. Yes, yes. For however, our Chinese audience. Yes, exactly. Um, however, uh, I, we will uh, we will seed and then and and go over to the LA Galaxy now. Now let's start a little bit with some uh, some retractions, some corrections and retractions. I seem to be getting a lot of these lately. I had a nice correct, corrections and retractions segment on Thursday show. So. Let's start here. Um, the one thing I want to correct is that uh, on the show, I think we said that uh, Jalen Neal, uh, a new signing for the LA Galaxy, uh, coming from the LA Galaxy Academy, uh, that Jalen Neal 
uh, weighed, uh, was six foot, 140 pounds, because that's what it had on the website, and that's what I was told. Um, so that is incorrect. He's six foot three, 160 pounds, uh, which means a lot in both directions. Um, so, How old is he, though? Uh, 17. See those kids? They just keep growing. They, he's they, probably taller and heavier right now than he, he was when you got that correction. He is. He is. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that's what it was. And you know, um, he's just hitting that growth spurt. He could, he, if he keeps up on this pace, Kevin, I expect him to be about. Oh, by the time he's 22, he's going to be eight or nine feet tall. He's going to be looking down on a lot of time. He is absolutely. Um, but anyway, uh, wanted to get that in and and out of the way. A lot of. Um, it seems like the 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 biometrics of Major League Soccer are about trying to get guys who um, trying to get their correct height and weight. Um, it seems to be a struggle right now, and I don't know why that is. We talk, we got Jonathan Bonds incorrectly, uh, and Bond actually uh, DM me on Twitter and said, "Hey, you know that's not my weight. I actually weigh 190 pounds, not 150 pounds. I think is what we had him at, um, which we said was really wafer thin, and he would probably blow over in the wind. But you know that was that was a crush. So anyway, once again, we started it by by correcting somebody's height and weight, and you know, sort of sort of rolling on from there. So Jonathan Bond has already reached out to you personally. Yes. Yes, and and I should point out that Jalen Neal's mom was the one who corrected me on this as well. So she reached out and and said, "Hey, you guys do a great job uh, on the podcast." And, I'm, and apparently, not great enough because we got we got the little details wrong. But anyway, um, well, the latest kid that signed is a neighbor of mine, Santa Clarita. Oh, you, oh, so you know him? I don't know him. But oh, okay. Well, you said he was somewhere. a na- he said he was a neighbor well, of yours. It's a big neighborhood. Okay, I just I didn't know. Is it snowing up there? By the way, there was lots of random snow around, so I didn't know. We, is it- we had little flurries, but they didn't stick. If, too bad. Uh, let's get to uh, Jonathan Bond a little bit. We did talk about him, but there was some. There was a very lengthy article, Kevin, that was written in uh, the Athletic. I mean, we're talking long form article on a guy who may or may not be a number one signing, right? I mean, we don't we don't really know actually where he stands in terms of uh, in terms of the LA Galaxy and the pecking order. We expect that he will compete for the number one slot. But if you go to The Athletic, which I suggest that you do, uh, and you read that, uh, it's a long form, super interesting, a lot of little details in there. Uh, it talks about how his mom met somebody um, in Seattle, uh, which was really interesting. So she's a Sounders fan. Uh, she met a Chelsea fan who was visiting from the UK. Um, one thing led to another. She ended up moving to the UK and Jonathan Bond was born. Um, so that's a just a crazy story in itself that soccer started all this. And now you have this 27-year-old goalkeeper who's coming to LA who says that he's visited LA many times, uh, but has never, it was, it was just for holiday. He goes, and it's a big difference between, you know, a holiday visit and going there to like stay and live. And uh, supposedly Jonathan Bond should be on his way to the United States this week. Um, so lucky him uh, flying out here too. There's a lot to that, though, right? I mean, I'm assuming he's got to get permission to leave. Health, he's got probably got a quarantine when he gets here. Yeah, I think there's quarantine. Um, I think anybody coming from the UK right now has to have a negative COVID test, and he's coming for work. So I imagine that he he is essential enough to where they will allow him to come into the country, do all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a process right now, as it probably should be. Um, but when you look at that, that's that's what he's going to be going through here in in the next couple of months um, is trying to get acclimatized to L.A., uh, looking for a place to live, all that fun stuff. Here is the interesting thing, though, is that in the athletic article, they did point out that his, what his contract is. And I think it's an interesting contract. Uh, so if they're correct, which I imagine that they are, uh, he has a two year contract with the L.A. Galaxy. And on the end of that, there's a two year, I would imagine, club option. Uh, for him to stay so he's 27 now so his contract would basically expire whenever he's 29 and the possibility to keep him through 31 you're talking about prime goalkeeping years for a guy um who's who is coming to the galaxy and he said it straight out in this article coming to the galaxy to be the number one he says he has respect for uh the other guys um on the team kevin but at the same time he's coming to be the number one well and a way to look at that contract is it's essentially a four-year contract and the club can opt out after two years jonathan bond has no say in any of that yeah yeah it's 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 pretty obvious that this is um rightfully so is is a two-year plus a club plus a couple club options on that and that athletic article also said there were there was other interest uh, throughout mls for this guy it's just not someone that's been foisted on the galaxy that there was other interest in this guy he's been known he's a known quantity 
he he is in terms of that there were other teams and they the the article points back to the summertime so in the summertime there were teams approaching him uh to try to get him to come to major league soccer and for whatever reason it just didn't work out i think the summer he actually signed an extension with west brom uh to keep him there uh the teams that were mentioned in the article in new york red bulls and uh and inter miami so David Beckham's team and the New York Red Bulls as well, looking at Jonathan Bond and however it happened, the LA Galaxy got uh, you know to the front of that line. Um, there's a bunch of hey, this trainer knows this guy, and they you know they ran into Kevin Hartman, and Kevin Hartman trained with this guy. It's it's a bunch of little weaves um, and 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 nods towards different people and and connections. And so you should you should read the article. It's a long read, and there were people who were actually complaining about that. I you know I personally like the long reads as long as they're interesting. And this one had a whole bunch about West Brom and a whole bunch about uh, Jonathan Bond. But bottom line is, um, I don't want to get it confused because from what I was told, and I'm fairly certain this is accurate it was a good source is that this happened quickly for the la galaxy kevin this was not something that they had planned on getting you know they weren't like hey we're gonna we've been after this guy for two years he's been on a list they've been tracking other guys who are on this list who are domestic eligible players but they weren't specifically targeting him so whenever they said hey we need a goalkeeper let's look at our list and they said oh well let's see if he's available I'm told that that call to West Brom and the deal that happened, it happened very quickly. Um, it was not something that has been drawn out over the last two or three months. It happened within a week. Um, everything very quick. So that's how Jonathan Bond ended up on the LA Galaxy. And you can tell he seems super excited. And you can imagine he is, Kevin. I mean, you know, third or fourth on the down the, the, the pecking order on West Brom. He signed an extension with them whenever they came up and were promoted to uh, the English Premier League. So, you know, that's exciting for him. But at the same time, he knows that he wasn't going to get much playing time, some cup time, that, that type of thing. And so in the article, he makes it clear that he knows he's good. Um, and he knows that he can start for the LA Galaxy. And that's not arrogance. It sounds like confidence from, from what he's coming from. Um, and that... You know, his teammates knew he was good, but nobody else knew he was good because he never got to play. Um, well, aren't you worried about his weight, though? He's put on 40 pounds since they signed him. <laughs> yeah, since they signed him. That's right. Well, uh, you know, one, one way to look at that is is here's a guy that's 27. I'm sure his dream is to play in the Premier League. Uh, it would be everyone's dream. Um, and he's 27, and he doesn't look like he's moving up the pecking order. Uh, he's facing the real possibility of his career ending before he ever really got to play – as a number one guy on a first division team somewhere. Um, so you may look at it and say, hey, the Galaxy doesn't really measure up to Premier League team. In his mind, this is a chance to be a first division goalkeeper. Maybe in the back of his mind, he's thinking, hey, if I can prove myself, maybe I go back to England. Um, or, or maybe he just wants to wash his hands of the whole thing. But, I mean, that age, a guy at 27 who thinks he's good, who, who has confidence and hasn't had a chance, um, this is a great opportunity for him. Yeah, it, it seems that way. I'm. Uh, it's going to be. Um, I, I just have a feeling, and I don't know how accurate this feeling is going to be, Kevin. Right? It, it's just we, we sort of just ha you get feelings about guys, but for whatever reason, just looking at the limited number of uh, highlights that he has, and just the way that he talks, he feels like a guy who can come in and make a difference. I mean, you know, the LA Galaxy don't have a number one going into camp. Um, they have time to figure that out, which is a, you know, a positive thing. Um, but at the same time, it's going to be a battle. So could Jonathan Klinsman come out as the number one? Yeah. Uh, Klinsman's younger. Bond has probably a little bit more life experience. So if you're going to put your money on it, Bond seems like he should be the number one whenever he comes in. Um, this is just a guy who's eager to show everybody in the world. And he talks about the LA Galaxy in terms of it's one of the biggest clubs in the world. Everybody knows that. David Beckham played there. Zlatan Ibrahimovic played there. Robbie Keane played there. I mean, he can name them all. And by the way, in the article, um, Robbie Keane wasn't mentioned in the article. And somebody in the comments said, can you imagine listing all those names and not listing Robbie Keane? And the author goes, actually, he did list Robbie Keane. I forgot to put it in. So it, it was one of those. It's like, no, this guy, this guy's dialed in. Um, you know, Jonathan Bond seems dialed in. So he's very much aware of where he's coming i think he sees it as a super opportunity kevin this this feels like the guy who's hungry to uh to make a difference uh and he sees this as his chance to be a number one and to be to play on one of the biggest teams in the world his words so i think that that is um 
That's a fun way to sort of start things out. You just wonder what happens whenever he comes and, you know, they give up five goals in a game and there's not much he can do. I mean, you know, if 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 the past is is sort of also predicting the future, the LA Galaxy have been fairly atrocious on defense and in goalkeeping. And there's been a lot of times where David Bingham, through no fault of his own, has given up four or five goals, you know, in a game um, because the LA Galaxy failed to, to, defend, to defend properly across the entire field. So you wonder how quickly the biggest club in the world thing sort of melts away and, and Jonathan Vaughn realizes that uh, he's he's stuck on a uh, on a mid to lower level table, uh, lower mid to lower level team in the table, uh, and and the Galaxy have a lot to fix. Maybe he's the reason it all turns around. But for whatever reason, I feel confident with with Jonathan Bond. Well, I was always told what what you want from a goalkeeper is a guy who will make the the. Um Normal saves, routine saves. It's like what you look like in a sh- for a shortstop. The guy who makes the routine plays and then makes one or two plays each game that he shouldn't make. That's a really good goalkeeper. Um, so if Jonathan Bond can do that, it'll certainly be a step up from, from where the Galaxy was. But my guess is he hasn't seen a back line like the Galaxy's um, for we'll, a while. We'll see. Maybe maybe the LA Galaxy maybe are completely better. changed. Maybe, the, maybe you know, uh, Viafania really solidifies things. Maybe People Gonzalez. I told you, and I think I've told you this, and I've said it on multiple, People Gonzalez to me is the guy who has the chance to save this LA Galaxy team. If he plays at 80 to 90% of what he's supposed to play whenever they signed him, the LA Galaxy have a better defense. Absolutely. Um, and it's much better. Uh, because I think that uh, that him and Steris could work well together, um, and I think the consistency with there. If if people Gonzalez doesn't show up, I know we talk a lot about uh, Chicharito, Kevin, but for me, it's Pipo right now is one of the most important players on the field. Uh, between Chicharito and and people Gonzalez, that's going to make or break what the LA Galaxy do right now. Assuming the LA Galaxy don't go out and get another center back, there's a rumor on that. Who's the who's the who's the glue? Who's the rock of that back line? I mean, I'm going to say it's Dan Steras, and then yeah, people... Yeah, that's why I picked two. Yeah, but, they, but I will tell you right now that you and I seem to be in the minority on that. I get blasted every time I say something about Dan Steras, and I well, quite honestly... Yeah. He, he's been the most consistent, not flashy, not great, but the most consistent, I think. Um, yes, he makes mistakes, but he's still been the most consistent. He and Sebastian Legetto are the only guys that go back to the last playoff team, the 2016, uh, well... There was the Zlatan playoff team, but the last Bruce Arena playoff team in 2016, um, you know, he has the cultural understanding. He has, uh, he knows what the Galaxy are all about. He has the time here with Dave Romney gone. Uh, he, I think he's become the, the rock of that defense. Is he the best defender in the league? Is he going to make a, a best 11? Probably not, but I think he's the guy that that holds that team together uh, or that back line together better than anybody else. I mean, I think the, the counter argument and I will play the, the devil's advocate on this is that uh, he has been in charge and in part of a bunch of defensive lines that have given up some of the most goals in, in, in LA galaxy history. Um, I don't think you can dismiss that, but at the same time, I don't know that the LA galaxy have had a cohesive defensive plan since Bruce arena left. Um, certainly in 2017, there was a gross lack of talent um, that would per- that prevented the LA Galaxy from uh, being anywhere near a, a good defensive team. And then you go into the Siggy Schmidt years, which I think are the best chances at being a balanced team. But, you know, you had Zlatan Ibrahimovic in there as well. And when you have Zlatan, Kevin, you tend to want to be a lot more offensive than maybe the LA Galaxy were set up to be, and and rightfully so. You have one of the best offensive weapons in the world. You should probably use it on a regular basis and keep feeding Zlatan. But there was no defensive idea, and certainly with Guillermo Varescaloto, defense was an afterthought to him, and I think that seems fairly well understood. I think Greg Vanny comes in with the perception and the understanding that defense is a whole you know, uh, team effort, and uh, and certainly I think you're going to see an improvement just with Greg Vanny. I know I just saw somebody saying, hey, fix the defense. Just replacing the coach isn't going to help. And part of me wants to say, actually, with a defensive plan in place, maybe the coach it can help uh, this defense and, and what it is. Well, here's an example of that. I mean, Dave Romney was a guy. I thought Dave was a great player, and I thought that you know I thought he was uh, you know important part of the Galaxy teams that he played on. But he was a guy that never really was given a position, was never a starter, a guy who was maybe the first guy off the bench. Uh, you know, that was his position with the Galaxy. He leaves the Galaxy, uh, a team without a defensive game plan, goes to Nashville and plays on the on the best defensive team and uh, first year team in the history of MLS, team that gave up less than a goal a game. Um, 
So, you know, he, he's the same player. He just went to a place where there was structure, defensive structure. He didn't, there was no, uh, you know, um, there was no uh, special thing that he learned when he got there. It was just they used his talents in a structured environment. And I think that's what you're talking about. If you take the players the Galaxy have and put them in a structured environment, they're going to be much better. Yeah, and if you put Walker Zimmerman in this, as a center back of the LA Galaxy, they also get better. I, I'm with you on your argument. I make that argument all the time. I am also very aware of the counter arguments. I think people think that I don't have understand counter arguments to all these things. I do. Um, I've just chosen either to rightfully dismiss them for reasons or uh, to dismiss them for purely emotional reasons. And those are, I think, are both valid reasons to dismiss something. So um, it, as long as you know what your your bias is, as long as you understand my understanding of defense comes from the fact that I was an OK center back. Kevin, whenever I played in high school um, and, you know, growing up through most of my my playing years um, and then intramurals in college and, you know, all that stuff. I'm not pretending to be a a good soccer player, but I do understand defense and I understand angles and I understand these things. And whenever I talk to defenders uh, like Ashley Cole, um, like Dave Romney, like Dan Steres, uh, I they can they can talk about things and I can understand that. And I certainly can see what happens out on the field. Um, the LA Galaxy so often get pulled out of position in terms of having your two center backs go two versus three is not a successful way to defend on you know, counterattacks and, and on breaks. And whenever you move so many players into that offensive zone, that's what happens. You're asking them to go two versus three all the time. And if you do that on a regular basis, you're going to get burned. I think we we understand that. And that started with, with Von Dom, I think. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Von Dom certainly, I, you know, here, that was the big sort of wrecker he center got back. He caught a lot. He, got he, he did, but lot. mostly in his second season, right? That was his second season where he got the first season. He was outstanding. Um, as a matter of fact, that season, and that was 2016. That was uh, Bruce's last year. Yeah. I mean, I think going back to your original argument, the coach, you made the point of Bruce Arena's last year. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it, you're you're right. Um, there's something to that, but yeah, in 2016, he was should have been the uh, the LA Galaxy MVP that year and the defensive MVP, and he would have been the first person to do that. We all know what happened uh, to keep that from happening. So anyway, um, yeah, that was just a little dip into Jonathan Bond and, and some other things. Let's get to some uh, some MLS news. Actually, let's get to a little uh, U.S. Men's National Team news because uh, both Julian Araujo and Sebastian Legette have been uh, were holdovers from the U23 camp that had. Had some overs playing in it, and they were training together um, in preparation for uh, the Olympics, which may or may not be canceled, uh, probably will be. Um, and uh, and then there was this idea that some of those guys would be asked to stay, Kevin, uh, and they would go over and they would join up with a U.S. men's national team uh, uh, training, and they would play against Trinidad and Tobago on, on January 31st. Um, and and saying that both Julian Araujo and Sebastian Legette have been held over for that, so that way they can play in that game on January thirty first. That's that's good news for both of them, right? Yeah, and Sebastian Legette is really you know he's a guy that the uh, working his way up as far as the guys they call into camp, domestic players, the guys they call into camp. Um, he's he seems to be a guy that they like and that uh, Greg Berhalter wants around. Julian's still trying to sort of uh, find his place. The team, by the way, left Bradenton where they had been training. They now are in Saras or in Orlando, which is where the game will be played. Mm -hmm. um, so they're getting in position for that game. Trinidad and Tobago, as we know, last time the U.S. played them, eliminated them from the uh, 2018 World Cup in Russia. Um, interesting, some some interesting news though that does affect or could affect Sebastian Legette is you know the the Nations League is supposed to come up this uh, this spring or early summer, and in the March window. Uh, the U.S. national team is going to have a couple of friendlies to prepare for that. Um, MLS season will not have started then. Greg right. Berhalter wants to have those friendlies in Europe for a number of reasons. That's where his the bulk of his first team is, the team that will be playing in Nations League and World Cup qualifiers. They're in Europe. With COVID, he doesn't want them having to kind of travel here and, and, and have to go through a uh, – you know, some sort of quarantine. So those friendlies, those U.S. Uh, team friendlies could be in Europe. The fact that they're, that's in March is good. Sebastian Legette might be able to go play in those games because it won't be an MLS schedule to worry about. Julian Araujo, if everything continues, uh, the schedule goes, he'll be in Guadalajara playing in the World Cup qualifiers, or excuse me, the Olympic qualifiers. Right. But Sebastian Legette, being a senior, not eligible for the Olympic team, which is a U23 tournament, he could continue with the national team and go to Europe as he did 
back in November. Interesting. Um, yeah, that is a, that is an interesting take on all that uh, to sort of see it. And, and obviously, Julian Araujo sticking around is is a good thing as he continues to mature uh, and will get hopefully another cap for that uh, U.S. men's national team as well. So that all is is helpful there. Let's get to the MLS schedule because you mentioned it a, a little bit here, Kevin. Uh, MLS came out today and announced that the start date for the 2021 season would basically be pushed back a month. Uh, delayed a month, and it would start on April 3rd and 4th would be opening weekend. Uh, that means that pre preseason camp, which should have started basically right around now, uh, if we're being you know honest about it, uh, would that, that should have started right about now is going to be pushed to February 22nd. And so with a February 22nd start, that will give the, uh, the LA Galaxy and teams around Major League Soccer uh, six weeks to get to the start of the season on April 3rd and 4th. Now, they also announced that ML the MLS All-Star Game will be played in late summer. That's in quotation marks. Late summer. That's the actual actual time they gave. Uh, so there will be an MLS All-Star Game, at least as far as they're concerned. Uh, I think that it's important to note that there was no solution announced for the Canadian teams, Kevin. They don't have an answer yet on how the Canadian teams will come down and play in the United States. But I know the answer to that question. Yeah, which is? By the way, is the All Star Game still scheduled for Bank of California? Did they say, and it will I, it be against Mexican teams? It, it did not say. So okay, but the solution to the Canadian problem, and uh, I talked to an MLS spokesperson today, um, and, and he didn't necessarily confirm this, but he kind of winked and nodded in this direction. Uh, President Biden has already signed an executive order uh, requiring his administration to begin working with the Canadians and the Mexicans, but especially the Canadians, to open that border, which has been closed to non-essential travel most of the last year. Right. Um, if you remember when MLS teams came back from uh, MLS's back, the Canadian teams played in Canada, which is what the NHL teams are doing now. So there was no travel for those teams. There was a Canadian pod, and they played each other multiple times. Uh, and then for the second phase of the return to play, those teams came down and they were billeted in the U.S. Uh, Montreal, I think, went to New York at Red Bulls. Toronto was in Hartford, and Vancouver was in Portland. And, and they were essentially home teams on the road. This time, MLS really believes that uh, this, there will be a solution that the Biden administration working with Justin Trudeau in Canada will have a solution in place by the time the regular season starts. Certainly training camps really won't be an issue. I think the teams will train in Canada right. uh, at their home base. But when the regular season starts, you know, we've got a lot of time. And, and I should say that you and I have talked about this date. We talked about the season being pushed back for months and, right. and a lot of people said no no don garber wants to start on time that was never really an option starting on time was never really an option and mls gambled a little bit they gambled they're going to start the season without any promise of any fans in the stands which means they're looking at another heavy half a billion to a billion dollar revenue hit right because there's no guarantee fans will be in stadiums even tony fauci said and anthony fauci is saying late summer, early fall before fans can be in stadiums. But MLS wanted a 34-game schedule. Mm -hmm. They're going to get that by starting now. Yep. Um, but there's some trade-offs. For example, the, the, the season ends on November what is 19th. It? 19th. 19th. Well, yep. No, that's the playoffs start on the 19th. Oh, yeah, yeah. Playoffs season, begin on November 19th. The season ends, I think, on the 7th. Uh, um, yes, correct. But there are eight World Cup qualifiers, CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers, three in September, three in October, two in November. The playoffs will start after the qualifiers are over, but these are the games that p teams are playing to qualify for the playoffs. They're going to be missing their best players for much of September, much of October, a little bit of November. MLS knows that. They decided to go ahead with 34-game schedule, ending essentially the same time this season ended. MLS Cup will be December 11th. This year was the latest ever, December 12th. So MLS has decided that they're going to play without fans to get a 34-game schedule. They're going to end when they end, even though many of the best players on some of the competing teams will be off in the World Cup qualifiers. Um, it's kind of a guts. I, it's kind of a gutsy call by MLS, but none of this is certain yet because they don't have a collective bargaining agreement. Yeah, uh, that is that is the big caveat on all of this. Uh, as you said, MLS Cup is on December 11th. Playoffs begin on November 19th. Decision day is November 7th. I should mention the late summer for the MLS All Star Game is also also includes Leagues Cup and Campionis Cup. So uh, we're talking about a it, it, the way it is laid out right now, Kevin, with 34 games. Uh, starting in April, it's not as con it's basically a, as condensed as a normal MLS season, right? Because normally they would end earlier and start earlier. That's the whole idea. So everything is shifted right now. But 
with COVID restrictions, with all those, I think we can expect that some games will be moved, some games will be canceled, some things will happen um, that will basically mean that some of these things will get pushed together. And then you have what I would imagine the U.S. Open Cup wants to come back and be played again. I imagine that you have, you know, the Leagues Cup and the Campionis Cup that are all only, I mean, you have uh, World Cup qualifiers, you possibly could have Olympic qualifiers. So. World Cup? Gold, gold cup. I mean, all this stuff is starting to pile on and to understand the condensed nature of the season is to understand all of those, uh, competitions need to get played, you know, in 2021. So, um, a lot of big question marks and you talked about it. This is all done right now. And it's an interesting, the announcement one is we, you and I expected there to be a delay Two is that if you're a cynical person, you would say that this announcement without a CBA signed and agreed upon, and yes, the MLSPA did come back and actually answer the MLS owner's uh, CBA. They came back. Now, we don't know what that answer is. We don't know what the proposal was, but they are talking again, and there are discussions going on about this um, at, at, you know, at, at, throughout this time, and Major League Soccer in, and Don Garber had their letter to the fans, which was an open, uh, basically public negotiation for the CBA and putting shame on the MLSPA and the MLSPA even like, you know, went on Twitter and said at us next time. Um, so they were very well of what was going on. So understanding they put this off. If you're a cynical person, Kevin, you're saying that this is MLS's way of saying, well, I mean, we're going to start on April 1st, MLS Players Association. So you guys probably need to negotiate a CBA with us and get this done. Otherwise, it's going to be your fault that we don't start in April. Um, if you're cynical, that might be the way that you're looking at it. Uh, we know that there's a deadline coming up on January 28th, which is when MLS said we're absolutely not negotiating past that. That is when we have to have the negotiations done. The CBA has to be signed by that. That was invoking the force majeure clause was basically allowed it to go through January 28th, which is coming up this week. Uh, they said we're not going past that. Well, with a preseason that now doesn't start until February 22nd, Kevin, I would imagine that the hard deadline that we're not going to negotiate past is going to slip. Um, and now they have until February 22nd. But to me, this feels a little bit like MLS putting the cart before the horse, although they certainly did need to announce something to fans because it's that time of year. This is when you normally announce what is going to happen with the season. By the way, I did talk to the Galaxy. There were no plans. Uh, they don't even know what the schedule is. They don't know who they're going to play where. You and I were talking about that earlier. Is it going to be a pod system where they play only local teams? Is it going to be travel? Oh, by the way, all travel will be by charter until yep. further notice. Um, so there, there's the possibility of distant travel, I assume, this is what that means. But, yes, there, there is that that uh, deadline of January 28th. I think by announcing that preseason camp will start on, the, on February 22nd, that just basically means that's the real hard, fast deadline. They can continue negotiating past January 28th if both sides want to do that. The league did come out and say today that it is prepared to ne negotiate around the clock mm -hmm. to get something done. Now, I I'm sensing that public opinion seems to be on the side of the players, and, and that may be why the league is so boldly and badly overplaying their hand. If you look at what the league said to the players, first of all, they forced them into a, a CBA last summer um, to get the MLS is back tournament going. They really didn't negotiate that. It was take it or leave it. And the players swallowed and took it. I think they thought they were going to get a little bit of, uh, um, you, you know, they were going to, it, it was going to be appreciated in these new talks, and it and it hasn't been. W what management came to the players and said is, you guys will get a hundred percent of your contracts this year. That that shouldn't be a negotiating point. I mean, they they signed a contract that said I am going to get paid X amount of money. Now the players did agree to give up. I think it was five percent of their contracts. Maybe maybe it was more, ten percent. But they did agree. The players agreed to give up some of their money to help the league with a financial burden last year. And what does the league do? It comes back and says, Hey, you know what? We're going to give you the money that we owe you. That's not a negotiating point. Right. That's not something to negotiate. We're going to give you the money we owe you, but in exchange for us doing what we already said we were going to do and we're contractually obligated to do, in exchange for that, we want to freeze the salary increases, which we, the league, already agreed to. We want to freeze those for two years. Right. I mean, I don't really think that that's a negotiation. That's like, hey, I'll give you a nickel for that dirty quarter you have. That's not negotiating. It's trying to take advantage of it. And I think the players – are to the point now where they've kind of had it up to here with this stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I can see that from that direction. I, I, I think my counterpoint, if you're looking at this, is that 
there are clearly going to be financial hurdles for Major League Soccer again. We know that they lost some money. And you, listen, I'm not going to spout off their billion dollar number anymore because I think that whenever you look at it, that's they certainly use the PR battle whenever they use the billion dollars that they lost that also included projected revenues um, uh, of those things. So, uh, you know, but there is going to be some you know, fans are not going to be back. Now, certainly we are having this discussion in the Discord, but when you look at, you know, fans where they're like, well, fans aren't going to be back. Why are they going to start in April? It's like, well, in some areas, fans are going to be back. They just probably won't be back in Los Angeles. Like the limited number of people going to some of these games. You saw the the women's, the U.S. Women's National Team game in Orlando. They had player, they had fans there in limited numbers, you know, spread out, that type of thing. Um, and I think you're going to see that through most of the league. Are you going to see that in California with the San Jose Earthquakes and with LAFC and with the LA Galaxy? Or are you going to see it in the Pacific Northwest with Seattle and Portland? I think those are harder sells. But are you going to see it in Miami? Are you going to see it you know, in, uh, in Houston? Are you going to see it in Austin? Are you going to see it in Dallas? I think that when you look at you know, just the histories of those states and already having limited number of fans in some of these areas, which... In my opinion, up to a certain point, I'm okay with. I don't, you know, I think if you're outside uh, and you're spread away from people and you're wearing masks and there aren't a whole bunch of people, I mean, we're talking about extreme limited uh, uh, attendance here, um, that I would see, we always consider risk. I consider the risk rather low. So, uh, you know, I don't have, but if you're looking for that in LA, Kevin, that's where it, you start to sit there and say, okay, well, fans probably won't be back in the stands in LA until early fall at the earliest. Um, and so there's going to be some hits and it's going to be hit across major league soccer. So the owners do are going to lose money again. Um, I think that their negotiating tactic though, of saying, well, we're going to make it up, you know, saying let's extend the CBA by two years is basically what, what it comes down to. Um, so the current CBA will extend it by two years shows that they're more than capable of taking those losses this year. To me, it's an overplayed hand uh, because they're like, well, listen, we're going to lose so much money that we need to invoke force majeure again. And by the way, our first proposal is that we can take the losses this year, which we said we weren't going to be able to. So we invoked force majeure. Uh, we said that, you know, we can we can handle it, but you just have to give us uh, more profit on the backside of this. And to me, that doesn't make sense. Uh, in terms of if you're negotiating a f and you're invoking force majeure, it's because something has changed so drastically this season, you need relief this season, not we're going to eat it again and then be able to come down the road and just make money off the backside. They've clearly done the analysis on this, Kevin. They clearly understand they're going to make money on that deal and they're okay with it. They're okay with taking the losses now. Well, another thing is one of the things they want to do is extend the CBA out five years. That would take it through the 2026 season. Where the, that's a problem potentially for the Players Association. Is one of the things that they want to talk about. They, the, the league wants to take back the money they had offered in sort of a profit sharing model with the new TV contract. They were going to share some of that money with the union. Now they don't want to do that. They don't want to share all of it. They want to extend the CBA uh, and, and the salary, you know, each year uh, the salary cap goes up and the, right. the, the minimum wage goes up. They want to delay that for two years. The, the interesting thing with that is my understanding is that would take that through the 2026 season. So the new CBA would not start until 2027. What happens in 2026? What happens is we have the World Cup here in the United States, as right. we all know or can predict. Soccer viewership, soccer interest is going to go through the roof. The league is asking that the players not to share in any of that revenue growth for that year, which could be astronomical. The players would leave a lot of money on the table if they're not able to enjoy the the, the profit sharing. That's a bad word, but the, the revenue increases that might be provided uh, in the 2026 season. The, the ownership doesn't want to share those with the players anymore. Well, I want to go back to, and I know you touched on it, but for the 34-game season, uh, we don't know what that means in terms of where they're going to travel, who they're going to play. Uh, there's no schedule right now. But if you go back to the 23 game season that we just played in the COVID era, it was regionalized, right? You played. Yeah, I think the new schedule is 17 at LAFC and 17 with LAFC at. At, 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 yeah by the way i was yeah, that's that's sort of my joke is i do not need to if it you're playing 34 games and it's going to be regionalized again you're going to be playing lafc 10 times and san jose 10 times and they're going to kill all those games i mean you, you, hey those are fun games uh when you play it four or five times they're not fun anymore uh, and it's just like okay next can you play somebody else I understand the COVID restrictions. I understand the necessity of having, of needing to do that. But if you're going to go in Kevin and play 34 games, I'm expecting it to be a real season. 
Um, I'm not expecting it to be regionalized. And if it is regionalized, that region better get a heck of a lot bigger. Uh, because if you're going to play the same teams over and over and over again, uh, they're going to lose their edge on that. It'll be too much for a 34 game season. I know that's crazy because I'm starving for soccer just as everybody else is during the break. And we just learned we're gonna have to wait another month, which I think most people are taking okay because we expected that it might be longer and it still could be longer. There's potential on this to back that up another month. No problem. Uh, if, if things aren't, don't, aren't going well, uh, if, you know, COVID cases continue to surge. I mean, uh, the Cactus League minor league base or the uh, the summer league baseball, basically the spring training baseball uh, that is the Cactus League in Arizona wrote a letter to Major League Baseball basically and said, hey, we're really excited for this uh, this spring training to start, except for uh, Arizona has a whole bunch of COVID cases and we think you should delay that start. So those are the types of things that you could see with Major League Soccer as well is understanding, hey, yeah, we're going to start. Oh, by the way, it's really bad. So no, we're not going to start well, and we're going to push backwards. We won't know for sure until we see the schedule, but my guess is they're not thinking of that regional schedule. And and another place where the regional schedule is bad is if you look at the six West Coast teams, it'd be Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, uh, San Jose, LAFC, and the Galaxy, right? Um, four of those teams made the playoffs last year. The Galaxy and Vancouver were the only two that didn't. So that makes the West region, if you want to call it that, the region, very tough. Then you look in the Midwest. If you're talking about Colorado, Cincinnati, Nashville, um, uh, you know, teams in there, not, not so tough, you know, Cincinnati is not, uh, you know, a strong team, Columbus, obviously very good, but so it, it's unequal. And then you look at records at the end of the season, you try to rank teams and who gets in the playoffs and who doesn't. And it's unfair. I don't think MLS would have sacrificed as we talked about to have a 34 game schedule if they didn't want to make it a real 34 game schedule right. and playing LAFC, 17 times is not a real schedule. So I think when uh, when MLS said, okay, we're going to eat it again, we're going to we're going to start on time and play a bunch of games without fans. If they wanted to have a 24 game regional schedule again, they would have waited till June. Yeah, uh, you're you're not far off there. Uh, by the way, 13 teams in the Western Conference this year because you add Austin FC to the 12 teams that were in the Western Conference last year. That means that Nashville stays in the Eastern Conference again. Uh, they have 14 teams in the Eastern Conference. All right, so 13 in the West, be, and there'll be one team that'll have a bye week every week because yeah. it's an uneven number of teams. They'll be eating those up like crazy, those bye weeks, uh, guaranteed. So, all right. Uh, so that's sort of where we sit on MLS schedule. So good news is you have a schedule. Bad news is we don't really know if that'll mean anything. Uh, both CBA and COVID could could affect those greatly. So uh, just sort of keep an eye on that as it goes down. I would expect that MLS and the MLSPA continue their negotiations. I expect that after the 28th, they will just agree to continue negotiating. Uh, although it would be a power move by either of them, either to strike or get locked out on the 28th, knowing that they uh, weren't supposed to start until the 22nd anyway. So, you know, Kevin, if you're right, uh, and the players are fed up, then a strikeout on January 29th, basically to, to force Major League Soccer into, you know, negotiating or, or folding towards, um, you know, the players could have an effect. Unlikely. I don't think that those are those are likely, even though the MLS PA has told the players to prepare for a work stoppage. Uh, they did that last year as well. So, just interesting times through, through all that. Anything else you want to put a put a bow on, uh, on on that discussion? We need to talk about rumors. We do. So let's do that. We need to talk about players at some point. <laughs> I was going to say that <laughs> there, it, it, it's quiet. Um, I would imagine with the extension to February 22nd that we will see more rumors as you get closer to preseason. But there's oh, plenty of time. By the way, speaking of that deadline, real quickly, just going back to the players' union thing. When you talk about the players preparing for a strike, remember. You know, they just uh, announced a new slate of additions to the uh, executive council, nine players. Mark Anthony Kay of LAFC is one of those. And I mention that because I, I think the players are, and, and I don't mean this in the derogatory way some people take it, but I, I do think that they are newly militant, newly woke. And the reason I say that is they just went through the whole Black Lives Matter thing, affected a lot of players. We saw the way MLS reacted to that. Um, and I don't think a ton of players felt like the league really had their back. Um, but th a lot has happened since the last real collective bargaining agreement was negotiated. Um, I, and I, I think these are newly woke players and I, I just don't think that they're going to roll over, uh, as the union has in the past. So when you talk about the possibility of a lockout or a strike or, um, you know, a lack of concessions and management overplaying their hand, I, I, I think this could get ugly before it gets better. Anyway, uh, very, very well could all right, on to the rumors. Uh, we have three right now. Three rumors and three rumors only. 
I can tell you only one of them is confirmed in terms of this is actually happening. There's actually stuff going on. So let's start with Christian Pavone because we've talked about him a whole bunch. We know about the sexual assault allegations. Um, and now there's an interesting wrinkle or, or maybe an interesting, uh, I was going to say angle, but ankle um, for oh, Christian. Pavone. Good. Yes, I, I'm turning into you. The dad jokes are flowing. <laughs> Um, but Christian Pavone and his ankle. Um, now, there was a report that came out of Argentina um, and, and a flurry of reports that usually come out of Argentina. But there was an, uh, a report that came out that basically said that there was something wrong with Pavone's ankle uh, and that he would need to get surgery on it. But that the player himself said, I don't want to get surgery on it. I want to transfer and I'll get a, I'll get surgery on it after you transfer me. Um it puts into a whole bunch of things, you know, let's let's put a, aside the allegations. Let's sort of look at what is happening here. We know that Christian Pavone told Boca that he doesn't want to play for them anymore and that he wants to be transferred out. Uh, then we know that Boca said, OK, well, we're going to go ahead and put you on the first team because you're our player again. And he said, OK, um, that's fine. And he reported and got his covid test and he showed up. And then basically they said he uh, you know, he's he's claiming or they're claiming that there's an ankle problem and that he needs surgery. And he's saying. No, no, no. I don't need surgery. I just I just need to be transferred. Um, and for that, you know, uh, Boca has said, OK, well, you train with the reserves then you're just on the reserve team right now. Then if you're not going to get surgery uh, and we're not transferring you, then you play with the reserves. The interesting part of all that, we don't know how true it is, though, Kevin. We've heard of these negotiations, especially in Argentina, going this way before. Um, and, you know, the whole the player is injured and he doesn't want to play. And this is a way for them to sort of force the transfer is that, oh, well, I'm injured and I'm not going to play. And that's why I'm just going to train over here to the side. And everybody sort of knows that this is a negotiating tactic. We don't know if that's the case. Uh, although I would imagine that the LA Galaxy also would have said, hey, you have a bum ankle and we all know it. Even that doesn't seem to be the case. So either it's a surprise injury or this could be all part of negotiating. Well, he did play a ton of minutes every minute for the Galaxy last season and a very condensed schedule. But if he had ankle problems, he didn't get hurt af after the season. He got hurt during the season. It wasn't like me. He didn't break his ankle uh, out for a jog one morning. Yes. Um, he was hurt when he went down to Argentina. And you would think if he's a smart guy, he knows he's got a condensed off season. He's going to be playing somewhere. Right. You would think that he, proactively he would have went to get the surgery. Now, maybe it was a case of because he his loan was coming to an end, he didn't want the surgery in December because he didn't know who would pay for it. That could be a reasonable exp explanation, but it, I, I just I'm very curious as to why, if he knew that he had this ankle problem, why he waited for six or seven weeks to address it. And it, it could be exactly what he said. Is is the Boca doctor the one that recommended the ankle surgery? In which case, he doesn't want to do it with the Boca doctor because he doesn't want to play there. Right. Um, there are a lot of questions about the ankle surgery, especially the timing of it. He played his last game November six or set November eighth, and we find out about the ankle injury two months later. That's pretty interesting. He's been hobbling around for two months and no one said anything about it. Yeah. It, it, again, timing and, and everything else that we've sort of seen uh, with him. It's all interesting. I, I don't know where I land on all this. Uh, his rumor right now, he's getting four out of five stars only because we know there's interest from the LA Galaxy. We know that they're negotiating. We know that all those things were true at one point and whether or not the Galaxy have decided to walk away yet, we don't know, Kevin. Um, but as of right now, we're still considering that Christian Pavone at 24 years of age is is the LA Galaxy's uh, left wing or right wing player uh, if they go out and get him and retain him. And if not, the LA Galaxy have an open designated player spot. So, um, those are the negotiations going on with, with Christian Pavone. Let's, uh, let's go to the, to the next rumor because it's one you and I have talked about. We have theorized, we have made it so that way it could make sense if they, if it happens. Um, but Sebastian Giovinco, uh, again, there were reports that came out today. Now the reports that came out today were from a, I will just say a questionable source. All right. So, um, I don't know how much we want to buy into those, Kevin, but basically there's another player for um, uh, Al Hilal who has come in and is taking minutes from Christian, uh, from Christian, from Sebastian Giovinco. Uh, and that could be an impetus for the player now to move to the, to the States because he's not getting as many minutes as he used to. So at 33 years of age, the midfielder slash forward slash central attacking midfielder, however you want to sort of do them could possibly uh, be coming to the LA Galaxy to team back up with Greg Vanny. And you and I have theorized, Kevin, that might mean 
a TAM signing. That might mean a designated player signing. It's probably in between those two, but that would be something that, that might be expected. It, it at least makes some sense in terms of the players and everything else. Well, and he could take that DP spot if Pavone doesn't take it. To me, it makes a lot of sense because he has a history with the manager. The manager knows him. He likes him. He's succeeded under the manager. He's in a league now, which I think in, in you know in the Middle East, I think be comparable, probably lower uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, competitive level than MLS. So he wouldn't be taking a huge step down. He would be coming to a place where uh, he's going to be compensated fairly. The, 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 the uh, you know, lifestyle is nice. He knows it. He knows the league. It makes sense to me for a whole bunch of reasons. And I believe his salary there in, I think it's Saudi Arabia, right? Where he's playing. Yes. His salary is about 4.4 million. So that's not that's not you know messy level that's it, that there's a bridgeable gap there whether you sign him for an extra year and pay him over that time as they did with Salatan whether again it's tam money whether he gets a, a you know a dp spot he'd be coming in making less than pavone would make so uh there are a lot of ways that i think that this makes sense i think the player is motivated i think vanny would would like to do it and i think the galaxy could certainly use a player of his skill and his position it would be a, a really good fit all the way around the, the the biggest hurdle that i see right now kevin is the fact that we can get nobody to confirm that the la galaxy are even interested and as a matter of fact, it seems to go the other way, which is that they're they're not interested, at least from the people who are saying, I, you know, I don't know anything, I haven't heard that type of thing. So, it, it, you know, I gave it another star. It was a two star rumor. I gave it a three star rumor. The only reason I did. Well, there were two reasons. One is that it has sticking around. It's not going away. And so sometimes that means something. Sometimes that doesn't. Um, but when we look at that, Kevin, I can sit there and say, okay, maybe this is, it at least makes sense. The other reason it got three stars is because I was bored on Monday. And so I decided to add another star and well, that's I, a good reason. yeah, I was going to say, I get to make up the reasons for stars. It's my, it's my chart. It's my rumors. It's all that stuff. So I, I get to make up the reason. So it goes to three stars. So, um, still a possibility. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but I'll tell you that the sources I have seen Kevin so far have not led me to believe that the LA Galaxy are are actively trying to land Sebastian Giovinco. And saying that, I'm sure they'll sign him tomorrow or something like that. Yeah, sometimes these things just fall in your lap. I mean, again, this one makes so much sense. Again, Jonathan Bond, they didn't even, that wasn't on the radar until a month, a week later, and it was done. Right. Um, where do you put, how many stars do you give me to the New York Times? <laughs> to the New York Times? Yeah. One. One. Mm -hmm. Basically, it means... So you say I have a chance. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's all rumor. That's usually what one means. It's all okay. rumor, you know? So so there's something to that. Let's get to our other one-star rumor. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to have to put you on there, uh, on the rumor tracker as well. Uh, by the way, cornerofthegalaxy.com, you can go there. We have the rumor tracker up and running. Um, and so uh, the other one that came out today was uh, Marcos Rojo, uh, defender, Manchester United, uh, 30 years old, Wrong he, Manchester. Yeah, I was going to say for you, it's the wrong. It's the wrong Manchester. For a lot of people, it's the right Manchester. You know, the guys Le at the top of the table. Manchester United. That's correct. Um, so Marcos Rojo apparently is able to leave Manchester United. I think his contract may actually come up this summer, but Manchester United have decided that he's probably uh, 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 extra to their needs as of right now. Um, and so there is rumors that he is headed out. Now he's Argentine. He's a center back. Um, if, if Guillermo Rivera Scalotto was still coaching the LA galaxy, I would be like this, this is lining up perfectly for him, uh, to go ahead and get, get Marcos Rojo. If you go on transfer market, Kevin, his market value right now, 6.6 .6 million high, but understanding that once he leaves Manchester United, that that transfer, that that market, his actual worth is probably going to come down considerably. So if he would go somewhere else, you would imagine that his $6 million market value would probably be in the three to $4 million range. If you're talking about three to $4 million and that's the market value, that's how much you would have to like pay Manchester United to get him. That's not necessarily his salary or anything else. Um, it's not out of left field in terms of amounts. It's not $30 million or something like that, right? So it's within reach, but it's probably not within reach of targeted allocation money, which is what I would imagine the LA Galaxy would look at trying to land somebody like Marcos Rojo um, as a targeted allocation money center back. Plus, we all know that Pipo Gonzalez is a TAM center back, and so they would be putting a lot of money on the defensive back line in terms of Tam. Uh, and so the rumor goes like this, Kevin. Uh, he is uh, he has told Boca Juniors that he is absolutely wants to come back there. This was the the, the rumor and, and sort of how it went, is that 
absolutely he wants to come back to Argentina and he wants to play for Boca Juniors and he wants to be that guy whenever he's done he's going to Boca Juniors and that's what he wants to do he's never played for them from what I can see in his history but he wants to go back that's where he wants to play and he's going to be there uh, however it says the only offers on the table as of right now are from uh, Getafe uh, in La Liga and the LA Galaxy then LA Galaxy's name was dropped in there which this one feels like it's one of those hey let's mention the LA Galaxy in this rumor yeah, let's see if we can drive it up. I was talking to an agent the other day, and he was saying I was trying to pin down some rumors around his player, and um, he would not allow. He he tried to talk me out of dropping any team. He wanted every team possible to be associated with his player, even though he admitted many of them were not true. The idea is that you create interest around your player. So I, I could totally see where an agent would drop the galaxy. They're not dropping FC Cincinnati as one of the teams that are interested or, or real salt Lake. They're, they're dropping a big money team, the galaxy into that mix, not knowing whether it's true or not, just trying to create interest around their player. I could see him definitely wanting to go back home. If you're going to leave the premier league and you feel like, you know, your career is taking a different direction. Why not go back home where you're comfortable, where your family is? I totally get that. The other thing that makes me think that this rumor is probably not true in the current form is the salary you mentioned or, or, or his his worth. Right. I think Omar Gonzalez was about 1.3, 1.4, somewhere in there, uh, his high end with the Galaxy. And I think at the time he might have been the first or second best paid defender in MLS history. I don't think any defender in MLS has gotten more than 1.8 or even 2 million, with the possible exception of Bastian Schweinsteiger, who came over as a midfielder a world cup champion in Germany wound up playing uh, defense. He wasn't signed as a defender. He wasn't paid that money to be a defender. So bringing a guy over as a defender and playing, paying him that much money, that just doesn't fit the way MLS has done things. And I don't think it fits a Greg Vanny team who they will be strong on defense, but I don't think it's a team that is built around defense. I think it's an attacking team and you're going to spend your resources in the midfield and forward, not on, on defense. Even though we just talked at the top of the show, I was going to say defense is a position of need. I was going to say that's a, it all comes back to, to what it is. Uh, I've been on the record as saying I, I'm, I'm doubtful that this LA galaxy team uh, under Greg Vanny and Dennis DeClosa are going to bring in a starting center back. Uh, I don't think it's what they need, nor do I think it's what they can afford. I think there are other positions of need that are more important. And you could claim, again, I am aware of the counter arguments. This team has given up more goals than, you know, any other LA Galaxy team. They bleed goals. How would you say that a center back, another center back? Because they already have center backs on the roster. They already have backup center backs on the roster. If you're asking for anything, I think that they could bring in one borderline starter center back that might fight for some minutes or push some people or be there in terms of injuries sort of as a backup. I think you need four center backs, but you look and, you know, with, uh, with Jalen Neal and, um, what was the other guy's name? And I can't, it's for and, I, and I'm saying it wrong. So that's why I'm trying to go back to my, uh, to my roster, uh, whenever I look at it, but, um, uh, for Kranis, uh, that's the Santa Clarita guy. Don't, yes. Yeah. That's your neighbor, neighbor. your neighbor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, with for Kranos and, and, and Neil, you look and they're both basically center backs. They are depth at that position. Now, I don't think they're going to spend time up at the senior team for, for much of this year. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think that you can expect those guys to at least be in the, uh, conversation. So, I mean, the LA galaxy are, are pretty, well stacked in that in that defensive side on those center backs bring in a backup cb that you know has some mls experience yeah that makes some sense as well but i really think the defense is kind of set in the way the the right backs the borderline starting right back is something that they need because with julian araujo and expecting him to be gone for things like olympic qualifiers or u.s men's national teams for uh world cup qualifiers or you know nations league or anything else that is sort of going on um with the u.s the, julian araujo is not going to be there all the time so getting somebody who can play right back is a uh, position of need. Uh, so, the, yeah, I mean, that's my take on this. So I think that Marcus, uh, that that Rojo, um, uh, Marcos Rojo, uh, coming to the LA Galaxy seems like a stretch right now. Um, yeah, that's me. Well, one of the things you talked about the roster, I mean, this season, last season they played, they're supposed to play 23 games. They played 22. Uh, they didn't make the playoffs. Um you not that you would have had a chance to construct a roster for that. Right. that that was not planned that happened but you can see last year they played 22 games and that was it 
There's no U.S. Open Cup. There was no international competitions in the way. This year, we already know going in, you've got Nations League, you've got Gold Cup, you have all these World Cup qualifiers, you have Olympic uh, tournament, uh, you're going to have friendlies. And we know on the club level, you know, again, U.S. Open Cup, uh, the All-Star Game. I think every player on the roster, all 30 players are going to play at some point, and you're going to need depth. And and the fact that Greg Vanny knows that and Dennis DeClosa know that now in late January for a season that starts in April is a huge help. Yes, they, they've already got, what, I think 23, 24 players on the roster, but now they can start to construct a roster that we need depth. As you said, we need four center backs. Because it's nice? No, because we're going to need four center backs. Right. If, if we're going to play this attacking style, oh, these outside backs are going to be run to death. We're going to need extra help at the outside back. And we may need players that can play a couple of different styles. Because if you have three games in a week, you're probably not going to want your center backs running, you know, eight kilometers, nine kilometers uh, three times in a week. I mean, it, you know, uh, world-class distance runners don't do that. Right. So, you know, as they construct their roster, that depth is going to become a big thing. And and I think maybe we should rethink some of these rumors and and, and not pay so much attention to the Sebastian Giovinkos as we do to the maybe the uh, journeyman MLS guys that may become available. You know, not that he's a journeyman, but we don't know what happened to Perry Kitchen yet. He hasn't, right. you know, he hasn't signed with anybody. Maybe that's where the team is going to turn their interest now. Guys who are a little bit cheaper options, but can give them some quality minutes because they're going to need that. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Uh, the the roster building continues, and I think without so much of the the deadline that we have seen, Kevin, obviously with the the start of preseason February twenty second, that if you're looking to have your roster complete, then now having that at February twenty second is a lot closer than you know January twenty eighth, which would have been uh, rather soon. And Dennis built well into you know basically the run up to the season last year as well. So I'm not overly concerned. I know a lot of people are. I am a little bit concerned in terms of the quietness surrounding the LA galaxy right now, just not a lot of rumors. I mean, there, you know, usually we hear a lot more. I think that is indicative of the overall global transfer market more than anything else, because it's way down, which way is way down. down. Right. And, and it's also, you know, the winter time, the, 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 the secondary window for, um, you know, most of the world and not the primary, like it is for uh, major league soccer. So all those things sort of combined and the uncertainty of going into uh, this summer, I think all those things are added to being a little quieter. So expect it to be a little more quiet uh, this year. So uh, yeah, the yellow galaxy will continue to build Kevin. That's what they're supposed to do. Right. Well, you know, the, the, talking about the transfer market, it was down, spending was down 23.4% in 2020. Uh, some, and, you know, it's all owed to COVID. And the number of players that were transferred, it was it's, it was the lowest uh, since 2010. Yeah. Um, or the first, it was the first drop since 2010. I think it was the lowest since 2017. So the transfer market definitely, uh, definitely affected. But speaking of those outside backs, the draft brought somebody who may be able to help the Galaxy with that outside back issue, uh, and and giving them some people that could play some additional minutes. Yeah, with with uh, with. Uh, Josh uh, Drack, who who came in, a lot of uh, interesting stuff sort of coming out through. There was an article on him, uh, Soccer by Ev, as uh, an SBISoccer.com basically had an article uh, talking to Josh Drack. And uh, there's some quotes here that we could sort of pull out. Um, you know, he said that there were a lot of emotions running through my mind when I was picked. Obviously, I was happy and excited, but most of all, I was proud of my journey of how I've gotten to the point I'm at now. Uh, I couldn't be more happy that the Galaxy picked me. Been a fan of the team since I was a little boy in the Beckham days. And I believe there's no better place to be. Um, so interesting there. I think the the big criticism, obviously, of college players right now is why'd you go to college? Why didn't you just stay in academies and the whole the whole deal? Uh, Drax sort of looks at that and says, you know, college soccer has helped me immensely in my development as a player. Uh, Jamie Franks and the staff, as well as my teammates at the University of Denver, have pushed me to be the best person, player, and leader I can be there. And there are no words to describe how thankful I am for them today. But college soccer has allowed me to grow mentally and take ownership of whatever happens with the team. And if things aren't going as planned, it's up to me as a leader to get things fixed so the team can be successful. He's really talking about his maturity and how uh, this is a kid who went and played with, with the Timbers Academy whenever he was in high school, uh, got to train with them in the Pacific Northwest for a little while, and he talked about how he wasn't ready for that. Um, he went up there. He was immature. He said he, you know, he missed. He was away from family. He missed his family. Like all these things were were clear to him that he was not, you know, mature enough to sort of make that step to be those that professional soccer player at that time when he was in high school. Um, and so his argument here is that college soccer has allowed him to develop. I think we dismiss that a lot because the college path is um, almost seemed as 
uh, unnecessary now, Kevin. And and certainly I am guilty of this, saying that the MLS Super Draft is largely a, a throwaway. And I think the odds are completely against somebody like uh, Josh Drack coming into the LA Galaxy and being successful. It, it just hasn't been proven out very many times in recent times with the LA Galaxy is you get young player coming out of college and all of a sudden, you know, they're they're effective. Uh, we haven't seen that. I think Tommy Meyer might have been the last one. I'm waiting for anybody to try to correct me, but that was 2012 when Tommy Meyer came in and ended up being a, you know, a center back player for the LA Galaxy and ended up winning an MLS Cup uh, with the LA Galaxy. He played that position. So um, it, it's been a long time since we've seen anybody do that. Could could Drac be that guy? He could be. Um, but Greg Vanny says you know, that he thinks, Greg Vanny thinks that there's not a lot of depth at the left back role, Kevin, uh, in terms of the academy. He says, you know, we have a lot of players playing in a lot of positions, but the left back is one where we're not exactly, you know, super full. And so maybe Josh Drack could come in and and be that depth. We can, he, and, and Vanny sort of said, we're, we can use this draft as a supplement to our youth system. Um, so I think that's all just very interesting stuff whenever you look at it i know on thursday we hadn't heard a lot from drac yet we did i didn't have a whole bunch of information um they talked about him switching positions which was the big question mark during the draft why he's a left back when he was listed as a forward and basically he's played forward his entire career and in november was the first time he they told him hey why don't you try left back whenever he came to the to the combine um basically for a tryout to, to get eligible for mls draft and everything else and he was so successful in that positions that his draft number uh soared kevin so he got a huge boost out of being able to play at a left back role and he probably went much higher in the draft. He probably wouldn't be with the LA Galaxy if he was trying to be a forward right now. Well, if you have a strong left foot, I think you can you play left back. It's it's one of those things where it's a position, um, it, you know, of need for most teams. And you look at the Galaxy again, talking about all those games and all those minutes. Who's their starting left back? Jorge Villafani is 32, right? He's got a lot of miles on him. He's a good player. Can he play three or four times a week when he needs to? Probably not. And there is nobody else there. It's not like the center back position. I mean, I mean there is. Do you want me to give you all the people who are left backs? Left oh. back it might be one of the deepest that they have in terms of the senior team. Well, so, who do you have besides Viafania? So Viafania is the starter. Danny Acosta is the, the backup, and he's coming oh, off of him. I forgot about him. I know. Yes. And then, yeah. you have, then you have Didi Traore as well, who's also a first team player right now who's a left back. Right? And so, I you know, where to me, what I see from Vanny is he saying that after those guys that there's not much at the academy level and so he's okay plugging him sort of in there, um, which makes some sense. Here, here's what uh, Drax said, by the way. He's going to agree with you on the left back role and, and he says, uh, and I quote, as a modern left back, I know I need to be able to defend first and foremost, but also get into the attack and give options on the wings to take players one-on-one -on -one, as well as a com uh, combine and, and put in a final product to create chances for my team. So he, you're, you're right. You, you need to have, we <laughs> we were joking around on Thursday, Kevin, because somebody was saying, oh, well, he's an attacking left back. And I'm like, in modern football, there's no such thing. You're just a left back because they expect you to attack as well, a left back he's going to be like robbie rogers he's going to spend a lot of time with galaxy 2 at the beginning of the season to learn to play that position i do like the fact that he's a former forward uh crystal dunn who plays outside back for the u.s women's national team was a forward and she's told me that one of the things about going from forward back is you know what the attacking players that you're marking you know what they're trying to do you know when you need to get back because you've been in that position you've tried to take advantage of other teams uh backs that get pushed too far forward so the fact that he understands going into this what a forward is doing and what the objectives are are good you made another good point though too and and uh, I, i'm not saying this is the direction a lot of players want to go but i i do think you're right that it's misunderstood when young players go away at and they're not mature at 13 14 15 no matter how talented they are you know andres iniesta one of the greatest players of all time when he went to the barcelona academy he cried for days he, mm -hmm. they had to send him home uh from la masia for a while because he couldn't handle as good as he was a soccer player at 13 14 he couldn't handle being away from his family for an extended period that almost killed the career of one of the greatest players of all time um and we don't sometimes understand that at 13, 14, some of these players aren't mature. And we see that in soccer. We see it in hockey where a lot of Canadian kids are billeted uh, in, in the town where they play major junior hockey, taken away from their families. It's very difficult. And a lot of guys wash out. And I remember a baseball manager in a in a rookie league team once, a guy named Andy Stankowitz, who played for the Yankees and, and the Houston Astros. He was a manager in a rookie league team. 
And they had a very talented team at Staten Island one year. And he said, the reason that we have a rookie league where these guys play every day for a, a month and a half and they take bus rides everywhere. He said, the idea isn't to train them to be baseball players. This is to weed out the guys who can't handle this right. and, and get rid of them before we invest too much money in them. And, and so you do see guys that mature at a different time period. This guy is probably a much better person and player now um, in the maturity wise, mentally right. than he was at 17 or 18, he might've been a better player then, but he wasn't going to go anywhere until he got the other parts figured out. Yeah. So, uh, a very interesting, uh, on Josh tracks, certainly somebody, uh, will follow again, draft picks are not automatically put onto rosters. I, I need to inform you that. So if you go to our, our roster tracking and transaction tracking, uh, you'll see the guys listed, but they will not be listed on the roster because the LA galaxy have to make the decision to list them on the roster. And as of right now, that decision has not been made, nor should it be. Um, so we'll see it. The other uh, signing is Preston Judd, who has uh, who signed a contract with uh, Sporting Kansas City too, the USL affiliate of Sporting KC, on January 13th of 2021. So this year, last week, basically, um, you know, is is another sort of question mark. We'll see. I think in all likelihood that somebody like Preston Judd probably ends up going to Sporting Kansas City 2 and playing on the USL team uh, with the LA Galaxy still holding his Major League Soccer rights. Where are uh, both those where do both those guys play college? Yeah, University of Denver in Colorado. I think someone in the Galaxy saw a lot of University of Denver games. Or or none and oh, it just yeah. Yeah, it was it was one of those. I I don't know how uh, how yeah, often. he he has a friend. Maybe we should take him too. <laughs> hey, hey, it worked the last time they did it, all right? So, um, you know, they're just going to start hunting for for teammates on that. So, uh yeah, it's one of those things. All right. Um, I think that about does it. We'll have a live show coming up on Thursday, of course. Um, so you can check that out. I don't know. I have no idea what we're going to talk. I think people think I know what I'm going to talk about on Thursday. That hasn't been written yet. Uh, the, tw- the 28th. It could be, you could be talking about labor negotiations. Could be, or I could be talking about nothing. God only knows about right now. Maybe the LA Galaxy will sign Sebastian Giovinco tomorrow after I've said there's probably nothing to that. Maybe, you know, right. if you're going to sign college teammates, they should Stanford. They look at Stanford or North Carolina or, they, you know. They, they they tried they tried Stanford. I mean the 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 uh, Tomas Hilliard Arce was yeah. was a Stanford guy, but also Todd Donovan was a Stanford guy. So I mean, come on, where where do you want to go with that? However you want to do, it. but um, just interesting long odds for any of those uh, those players to make the uh, the jump to the LA Galaxy and the senior team. So uh, we'll see we'll yeah, see how it goes. Would you rather be trying to make this team as a left back or as a or as a forward? Yeah, left back. I mean, we've yeah. we've gone over that many times, so that's it. All right, Kevin. Anything else you want to get to uh, before we're? I gotta go. I gotta go wash my leg or something. I don't know. I- Change my change my cast something. Over I gotcha. Here. All right, sounds good. If you're looking for Mister uh, Kevin Baxter on Twitter, it's at k baxter eleven. Head on over to uh, let's see uh, the L A Times. That's where you write. I remember now. LA New York Ta- Times. No, that's not it. Uh, but head <laughs> on over yet. to the L A Times, and you can find Kevin's writing there. He's uh, covering soccer, U S Women's National Team, U S Men's National Team, all the soccer in Southern California as well. So make sure you do it at k baxter eleven l a times dot com. All right. If you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at j Guessman, J G U E S M A N, and of course at Galaxy Podcast, corner the galaxy.com, where you can find all of our articles. Ramiro has a new one up there. Make sure you check it out. All right. For Mr. Kevin the Panda Baxter, I'm Josh Pato Guessman, and you've been watching and listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on corner of the galaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on corner of the galaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.